Hello and welcome to Inside the Women of Denver, where we talk to local leaders about their successes, failures, and lessons learned on the journey to success. I'm Crystal Covington, and today I'm talking with Lisa Diamond, a doctorally trained nurse practitioner who helps women live a healthier lifestyle by managing stress and discovering their life purpose. She teaches tangible tactics for reducing stress and especially loves showcasing the value of knitting as a tactic for overcoming some of our most nagging health concerns. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Crystal. That was a great introduction. <laughs> wow. I know a lot about you now. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> so let's start by expounding a little bit on who you are. Tell us a little bit about you and your career. Okay. Well, as you said, I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been one for a very long time. Florence Nightingale and I went to school together. <laughs> and um, uh, I have started a um, program called the Happiness Knitting Project in which I use contemplative knitting to help women decrease stress. Um, about six, seven years ago, I started knitting myself, primarily to get across I-70 in Kansas, <laughs> um, because there was a grandbaby on the other end, and I was determined to go visit a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, sitting in the car, I wasn't driving, monotonously, you know. And so, I needed, I had to have something to do with my hands. I'm not one to just sit. And if I read, it kind of makes me nauseated. So I started one to learn to knit. And I wanted to also give back, um, but I did work so much I didn't have time. So I thought, well, if I knit little hats for babies in the NICU, I can be a volunteer, but I don't have to leave my house, brush my Aww. teeth, any of those. So, and I can go see my <laughs> grandbaby on the way, so I'm knitting little baby hats across I-70. And it, I started to realize how therapeutic and meditative it was for me. And being in the science field, I wanted to find out if there's science about this. You know, what is the science about that? Has anybody studied this? You know, is there something about that, it's just more than just me. And so I came across a woman in the UK who was part of a principal investigator for a research study that was over 3,000 people in 14, I think, 2014. And what they found in their study was that 72% of the respondents said that knitting had decreased stress, decreased their anxiety, decreased their depression, and increased their happiness and calmness. Wow, and I thought, that's ding, so ding, 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 there's something about yeah. this. So then I wanted to find out, well, okay, um, you know, more and more of my patients were coming in with illnesses that could have been prevented by stress. You know, I intuitively knew this, but I wanted to find out again, what does the research say about this? And I came across a new um, area that was really just developed in the late 80s for, um, in medicine called psychoneuroimmunology. And it's how, how our mind affects our brain and our endocrine system and our immune system. So I knew there was something else to this. So I started researching that and finding out that 60% of all illnesses from colds to cancer are not related to stress. Wow. That's, <clears throat> that's a big profound. Number. And so if we really want to talk about in medicine, we talk about primary prevention. Let's let's not try and make people better after they're sick. Let's prevent it in the first place. So how are we gonna do that? Well, if we fix stress or help people cope with stress, mm -hmm. then they don't get as many colds. They don't get mutations in their genes that cause them to have cancer, regardless of whether they have it in the family or not. So then I started, how can I put these two things together? Yeah. Um, and I started prescribing knitting to my patients. I mean, wow. actually prescribing. You need to go learn to knit. Um, and I also talked to them about journal writing and yoga and all these other things too. And so um, then that kind of led to doing community events where I was teaching people at the library. And then the local elementary school as part of their master's program for their mm -hmm. kids asked me to come and teach third graders. You want to talk about wiggly people <laughs> with sharp <laughs> objects. Oh my gosh, and string. <laughs> Oh, um, goodness. Yeah, 25 of them, and it, 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 we did good. We did good. It was in the morning, so I couldn't drink before. Oh. Um, but wow, were they, yeah, they were amazing. And it was so funny because one of them, I, I did it probably for eight weeks or so, um, and the kids could sign up. They had all these people in the community who wanted to sign up to be part of the master's program. So you had a career that you did or a hobby that you did and you could sign up to volunteer uh -huh. and take one of these classes. So where they had forestry and rocketry and commuters, I had more kids sign up for knitting than any of those other things. What? Seriously, who knew, right? No boys way. Boys even? Yeah. Little boys yeah, knitting. Yeah, boys and girls. It was so much fun. And so in one of the classrooms, they had this big, this was up in the mountains, and so it's a lot more horsey and out in the country and stuff. They had this big horse trough filled with pillows, and the kids would sit in there to read. 
Well, after the couple weeks and they had kind of got the feel for it, I would see in there these little third graders, their little butts are this big, and the, all these little butted girls sitting in this horse trough knitting uh -huh. and just beep, 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 <laughs> like in you know an old-fashioned beauty parlor or something. It oh, was hilarious adorable. to watch them talking about their lives while they're figuring out how to knit. You know. So how long does it take? I mean, it seems like it would take me forever to figure out how to cross those little strings and make it into something. I mean, your sweater. You said you knitted that. I did. Yeah. I don't. Uh, how could you possibly? How long does it take to figure out how to turn these threads into that? Seven years. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. <laughs> no, I mean I started with scarves and like everybody else, you know. Um, I, I think that the kids really showed me that they had uh -huh. no fear. Uh, you know, us as grown-ups have got to get it right because we're successful in everything yes. else, right? So we've so got to get about it. the yes. anti-stress program. Yes, we stress <laughs> about the anti-stress. And then knitting is not stress relieving. I'm so, and I've got a hole, and I've got to rip it out and fix it. And it was funny because at the hospital that I worked, I started a group. We really wanted to get um, help morale across disciplines. And mm -hmm. so I thought, okay, I'm going to start a knitting group. Fridays at lunch. Um, anybody can come and I'm going to teach you how to knit. And I had people come from all across the organization, even men, and it was so funny. The most tightly wound employees were the most tight, you know, <laughs> I mean, they were whole, and if it wasn't right, they kept ripping it out. It c couldn't miss a thing. I was, just go with it. Just learn it. <laughs> ripping it out again. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really, you know, art imitates life, right? Yeah, and their personality. I probably so, be one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get it. <laughs> Once you get it and you get in the groove, it's very methodical and very yeah. repetitive. And just like learning anything new, you weren't great at it when you first started it, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody's great at yoga when they first do it or meditation or anything like that. And so it's just wanting to do it and being consistent yeah. with it. So my younger sister would hate me if I had this show without asking you this question. So she's a uh, RN and she's got aspirations to just keep going and keep going. She's never going to quit school. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> but she would love to know a little bit about your story of, you know, what did it take to become doctorally certified? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's the right term for it. But talk about getting that diploma. Well, I started with a two-year college degree um, and finished in three years. So. I was awesome at it, <laughs> and um, and then I worked for a little while. I had my kids, wanted to spend time with them, so I only worked part time, you know, and that was that was great. And then um, we moved to Colorado, and I really wanted more in my career. I wanted more than you know, bedside nursing is is exhausting and it's very stressful and all of that. And so I wanted to do something a little bit more. So I started working in home care, and I found that I was seeing patients out in the rural areas where it was just me. I was the only person that was connected to their healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. So if something was going wrong, I had to really be good at figuring it out and being able to relay that information so that, you know, their their medical provider could make medicine changes or decide if they needed to come in or did they need to go to the hospital. I really started to like that autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, okay, I need to go back and get some more degrees. Um, and so then I went back and finished my bachelor's degree and then I went directly into grad school. Um, and uh, got my nurse practitioner, my master's degree. So that was okay. another five years of my life lost. Um, and um, then I worked and was a nurse practitioner for, oh, I don't know, 11 or 12 years, 15 years, I don't know, many years. And then decided, I need to have a doctorate now. I don't know why. <laughs> you just wanted it? Because somebody else has it. one, so I need one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very competitive with myself. Oh, my God. What do you mean you someone has that? I don't. <laughs> chop, chop. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love learning. I mean, I've always loved to learn. Yeah. I'm a nonfiction documentary freak. I mean, that's, oh, yeah, yeah me love too. that. You love that. That's what I like to read. That's what I like to watch. I love to learn all the time. If I'm not learning, I feel like I'm wasting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, to read a mindless beach novel puts me over the edge because I'm not learning anything, mm -hmm. you know. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets, can't stand it. What about movies? Uh, Do you like movies? Yeah, yeah, but that's only okay. two hours of my life I have to give yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love movies. And yeah, that's, that's good, but um, so anyway, so I decided, okay, so there's this, you know, this, this doctoral degree, and this sounds kind of awesome, and I'm going to go figure this out. And by the time you realize these are life years you will never get back, and these yeah. brain cells, you're too far into it, you just have to finish. Yeah. So I did that and finished at the University of Colorado last May. So nice. now Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. 
So, and I wanted to be a professor as well. I wanted to give back and teach yeah. a little bit and be able to travel and still, you know, to ha have my computer and teach online and, you know, add that to my repertoire as well. I love the fact that you said that someone else had it, so you felt like you had to get it. <laughs> I just, w I was, um, literally, we had a Facebook discussion, me and another person, about the concept of the people, the people that we're around sometimes drive us farther and farther, and I guess if you're not feeling that sense, then you probably need to get around a different group of people, but, you know, they will, mm -hmm. your, your, gr your peer group will drive you to the edge of what you can accomplish. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think so, I think so. It's funny because I had heard from a fellow nurse practitioner the other day, I was trying to refer a patient to her and we hadn't spoken in probably five years and she, you know, she wasn't at the place where I thought we, we knew each other from and she said, no, she said, you know, you, you really had an impression on me um, that I could go and do bigger things and, yeah. and I finally got out of there and I'm doing this and um, I just wanted you to know that. And I, wow, really? So you'd never know the impact you're going to have on someone. I mean, you may have said one thing or something and five years later it's still in their head mm. and they feel compelled to go back to school and get a degree because somebody else has it or get that different job and get out of a dead end bad situation and go for the, the other job. So you just, you know, you just never know. Yeah. So impart a little bit of wisdom on us stressed out, anxious individuals, okay? <laughs> what are a few things that we can do um, besides knitting, something that we could do right away that can help us, you know, reduce the amount of stress that we're dealing with? Let's say you started a new job. Let's say you deal with anxiety. <laughs> you know, what can you do to kind of reduce that, especially when you're dealing with new things in your life. Mm -hmm. Journal writing. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, when my kids were really little and I was home a lot with them and not feeling like I was productive, you know, and all that, mm -hmm. um, journal writing saved me um, because that was my counselor. That was my therapy. Uh. And I've got, you know, 30 some years worth of journals now that I write everything in. Um, and that, I think, is a huge stress buster for me. That was actually one of my first um, workshops that I ever done was journal writing for self-discovery. Wow. Yeah, because everybody can write. You can get a 59 cent composite book, you know, the yeah. covered ones at the grocery and a pen and just yeah. start writing. Be your own counselor. Right, you can. So what do you write? What should we be writing in a journal? Do you just kind of free association? Are you an overachiever? You have to have a rule. I am an overachiever. <laughs> okay, what I am I going to write? Know. I have a notebook. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> yes, you okay. call me. So there's no rules except the only rule is you have to date every entry. Oh, okay. okay. That's all. So that when you go back to look at it, you'll know where you mm. were in, in life at that time. Right? Okay. So that's it. Otherwise, and, and you have to feel like you can be open and free and that, you know, it's not like your journal when you were 12 and someone, your brother or whoever's going to look through it. I mean, you mm. have to have that sense of safety. Yes. Um, and then you just write whatever you want. I mean, some days when I wasn't sure what to start with, I would start with the weather. It was benign. It wasn't. And then you'd be amazed. You know, 20 pages later, I look back and go, how did I get from weather to that? You know, the profound <laughs> things that are rego hashing around in your head and you can't make them stop, they, you just keep the pen moving. And there's something, again, about that moving the pen and the brain that gets that out and gets it on paper. It's very, very therapeutic, too. All right. Well, I'm going to buy myself a journal right now. Mm -hmm. As soon as I leave here, I'm going to pick one up. Um, so what are some other lessons that you'd like everybody to learn from your journey? I mean... As I said that I was going to be interviewing you, I had tons of people saying, I can't wait to learn her story. So what is one of the biggest lessons that you feel like you want to leave everybody with from the journey that you've been on? We have to, you know, catch all those okay. people that were just so captivated by yeah, you. Yeah, I know. I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> um, I think, you know, my life and career has been about trying new things all the time you know and if i want to learn something new i would go get another degree i don't necessarily recommend that it can get expensive but mm -hmm. um and brain power but i think you have to just keep trying things you know and and not be afraid to go on an adventure um you know and go try new things and if it doesn't work oh i'm a failure at that so it didn't work there's not an entrepreneur on the planet who hasn't had failures. They just don't exist, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think educate yourself, whether it's classes, mm -hmm. whether it's lectures, whether it's joining groups like this, meeting people, mm -hmm. and just try a bunch of things until you figure out what your niche is. And it will change 
from today what it might be in two years from now. And you have to allow yourself to do that. You can't be so rigid that this is what I started, this yeah. is what I've got to end with, I've got to stick with it. You have to flow and be flexible. Yeah, I love that term, the flow. Just mm -hmm. go with the flow, be in flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nice. if it's not a right fit for you, be okay to give it up mm -hmm. and not say I'm a failure. Yeah. Because it wasn't the right fit. And if you're banging your head against the wall all the time to try and make it work, it's not where you're supposed to be. It's, you know, life shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. So don't make it on yourself that hard. Amazing. So. Thank you so much for everything mm -hmm. you shared. This was awesome. Was that profound? So know. many awesome stories. Hope so I didn't stories. disappoint anybody. <laughs> no. You d well, we'll find out. So yeah. <laughs> leave us a message on this, on this <laughs> show. If you're watching on YouTube, leave us a message. Send us something and say, hey, what else you want to know from Lisa? Yeah, Don't right. <laughs> I'll let you back. Because <laughs> there were some people, they were just really interested in hearing something about you and learning more about who you are. So you have captivated some folks. Well, good. Yeah. That's awesome. Good. You never know. Yeah. You've made an impact. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank everybody for watching this show. We really appreciated spending time with you. Thank you for spending time with me, Crystal Covington, and my guest, Lisa Diamond. I want you to always remember that you deserve to be seen, heard, and known. Have a great one.